Hi, thank you for joining me today. We're reading through A Course in Miracles, the main text, and today we are completing chapter 16. Chapter 16 is the forgiveness of illusions, and we are on chapter, or rather section five, the choice for completion. In looking at the special relationship, it is necessary first to realize that it involves a great amount of pain. Anxiety, despair, guilt, and attack all enter into it, broken into by periods in which they seem to be gone. All these must be understood for what they are. Whatever form they take, they are always an attack on the self to make the other guilty. I have spoken of this before, but there are some aspects of what is really being attempted that have not been touched upon. Very simply, the attempt to make guilty is always directed against God, for the ego would have you see him and him alone as guilty, leaving the sonship open to attack and unprotected from it. The special love relationship is the ego's chief weapon for keeping you from heaven. It does not appear to be a weapon, but if you consider how you value it and why, you will realize what it must be. The special love relationship is the ego's most boasted gift and one which has, been, has the most appeal to those unwilling to relinquish guilt. The dynamics of the ego are clearest here. For counting on the attraction of this offering, the fantasies that center around it are often quite overt. Here they are usually judged to be acceptable and even natural. No one considers it bizarre to love and hate together. And even those who believe that hate is, sin merely, uh, hate is sin merely feel guilty and do not correct it. This is the natural condition of the separation. And those who learn that it is not natural at all seem to be the unnatural ones. For this world is the opposite of heaven being made to be its opposite, and everything here takes a direction exactly opposite of what is true. In heaven, where the meaning of love is known, love is the same as union. Here, where the illusion of love is accepted in love's place, love is perceived as separation and exclusion. It is in the special relationship born of the hidden wish for special love from God that ego's hatred triumphs. For the special relationship is the renunciation of the love of God and the attempt to secure for the self the specialness that he denied. It is essential to the preservation of the ego that you believe this specialness is not hell but heaven. For the ego would never have you see that separation could only be loss, being the one condition in which heaven could not be. To everyone, heaven is completion. There can be no disagreement on this because both the ego and the Holy Spirit accept it. They are, however, in complete disagreement on what completion is and how it is accomplished. The Holy Spirit knows that completion lies first in union and then in the extension of union. The ego completion lies in triumph and in the extension of the victory, even to the final triumph over God. In this, it sees the ultimate freedom of self, for nothing would remain to interfere with the ego. This is its idea of heaven and therefore union, which is a condition in which the ego cannot interfere, must be hell. The special relationship is a strange and unnatural ego device for joining both hell and heaven and making them indistinguishable. And the attempt to find the best of both worlds has merely led to fantasies of both and, it is, and to the inability to perceive either as it is. A special relationship is the triumph of this confusion. It is a kind of union from which union is excluded, and the basis for the attempt at union rests on exclusion. What better example could there be of ego's maxim, seek but do not find? Most curious of all is the concept of the ego 
or rather the concept of the self, which the ego fosters in the special relationship. The self seeks the relationship to make itself complete. Yet when it finds the special relationship in which it thinks it can accomplish this, it gives itself away and tries to trade itself for the self of another. This is not union, for there is no increase and no extension. Each partner tries to sacrifice the self he does not want for one he thinks he would prefer. And he feels guilty for the sin of taking and of giving nothing of value in return. How much value can he place upon a self that he would give away to get a better one? The better one, the better self the ego seeks is always one that is more special. And whoever seems to possess a special self is loved for what can be taken from him. Where both partners, where both partners see this special self in each other, the ego sees a union made in heaven. For neither one will recognize that he is asked for hell, and so he will not interfere with the ego's illusion of heaven, which is offered him to interfere with heaven. Yet if all illusions are of fear, and they can be of nothing else, the illusion of heaven is nothing more than an attractive form of fear in which the guilt is buried deep and rises in the form of love. The appeal of hell lies only in the terrible attraction of guilt, which the ego holds out to those who place their faith in littleness. The conviction of littleness lies in every special relationship, for only the deprived could value specialness. The demand for specialness and the perception of the giving of specialness as an act of love would make love hateful. The real purpose, the special relationship, in strict accordance with the ego's goals, is to destroy reality and substitute illusion. For the ego itself is itself an illusion, and only illusions can be the witness to its reality. If you perceived the special relationship as a triumph over God, would you want it? Let us not think of its fearful nature, nor the guilt it must entail, nor of the sadness and the loneliness. For these are only attributes of the whole religion of separation and of the total context in which it is thought to occur. The central theme in its litany to sacrifice is that God must die so you can live. And it is this theme that is acted out in the special relationship. Through the death of yourself, you think you can attack self and snatch it from other people to replace the self you despise. And if you despise it because you do not think it offers the specialness that you demand, and hating it, you have made it little and were unworthy because you are afraid of it. How can you grant unlimited power to what you think you have attacked? So fearful has the truth become to you that unless it is weak and little, you would not dare to look upon it. You would think it safer to endow the little self you made with power you wrested from truth, triumphing over it and leaving it helpless. See how exactly is this ritual enacted in the special relationship. An altar is erected between two separate people on which each seeks to kill his self and on his body rise another self to take its power from his death. Over and over this ritual is enacted. And it is never completed, nor will it ever be completed. The ritual of completion cannot complete for life arises not from death, nor heaven from hell. Whenever any special form, special relationship tempts you to seek for love in ritual, remember love is content and not form of any kind. The special relationship is a ritual of form aimed at raising the form to take the place of God at the expense of content. 
There is no meaning in the form and there never will be. The special relationship must be recognized for what it is, a senseless ritual in which strength is extracted from the death of God and invested in his killer as the sign that form has triumphed over content and love has lost its meaning. Would you want this to be possible, even apart from its evident impossibility? If it were possible, you would have made yourself helpless. God is not angry. He merely could not let this happen. You cannot change his mind. No rituals that you have set up in which the dance of death delights you can bring death to the eternal. Nor can you choose and substitute for the wholeness of God have any influence at all upon it. See in the special relationship nothing more than a meaningless attempt to raise other gods before him. And by worshiping them to obscure their tininess and his greatness. In the name of your completion, you do not want this. For every idol that you praise or that you raise to place before him stands before you in place of what you are. Salvation lies in the simple fact that illusions are not fearful because they are not true. They but seem to be fearful to the extent to which you fail to recognize them for what they are, and you will fail to do this to the extent to which you want them to be true. And to the same extent you are denying truth and so are failing to make the simple choice between truth and illusion, God and fantasy. Remember this, and you will have no difficulty in perceiving the decision as just what it is and nothing more. The core of the separation illusion lies simply in the fantasy of destruction of love's meaning. And unless love's meaning is restored to you, you cannot know yourself who share its meaning. Separation is, the is only the decision not to know yourself. This whole thought system is carefully contrived learning experience, designed to lead away from the truth and into fantasy. Yet for learning that would hurt you, God offers you correction and complete escape from all its consequences. The decision whether or not to learn to this course and follow it is but the choice between truth and illusion. For here is truth separated from illusion and not confused with it at all. How simple does this choice become when it is perceived as only what it is? For only fantasies make confusion and choosing possible, and they are totally unreal. This year is thus the time to make the easiest decision that ever confronted you, and also the only one. You will cross the bridge into reality simply because you will recognize that God is on the other side and nothing at all is here. It is impossible not to make the natural decision once this is realized. So reading on, chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions, section six, The Bridge to the Real World. The search for the, re the special relationship is the sign that you equate yourself with the ego and not with God. For the special relationship has value only to the ego. To the ego, unless a relationship has special value, it has no meaning, for it perceives all love as special. Yet this cannot be natural, for it is unlike the relationship of God and his son, and all relationships that are unlike this one must be unnatural. For God created love as he would have it be, and gave it as it is. Love has no meaning except as its creator defined it by his will. It is impossible to define it otherwise and understand it. Love is freedom. To look for it by placing yourself in bondage is to separate yourself from it. For the love of God no longer seek for union in separation 
nor for freedom in bondage. As you release, so will you be released. Forget this not, or love will be unable to find you and comfort you. There is a way in which the Holy Spirit asks for your help, if you would have his. The Holy Instant is his most powerful, helpful aid in protecting you from the attraction of guilt, the real lure in the special relationship. You do not recognize that this is its real appeal, for the ego has taught you that freedom lies in it. Yet the closer you look at the special relationship, the more apparent it becomes that it must foster guilt and therefore must imprison. The special relationship is totally meaningless without a body. If you value it, you must also value the body. And what you value, you will keep. The special relationship is a device for limiting yourself to a body, for limiting your perception of others to theirs. The great rays would establish the total lack of value in the relationship if they were seen. For in seeing them, they would, the body would appear because its value would be lost and so would your whole investment in seeing it would be drawn, withdrawn from it. You see the world you value. On this side of the bridge, you see the world of separate bodies seeking to join each other in separate unions and to become one by losing. When two individuals seek to become one, they are trying to decrease their magnitude. Each would prefer, rather, each would deny his power for the separate union excludes the universe. Far more is left outside that wouldn't be taken in, for God is left without and nothing is taken in. If one such union were made in perfect faith, the universe would enter into it. Yet the special relationship the ego seeks does not include even one individual. The ego wants but part of him and sees only this part and nothing else. Across the bridge, it is so different. For a time, the body is still seen, but not exclusively as it is seen here. The little spark that holds the great rays within it is also visible, and this spark cannot be limited long to littleness. Once you have crossed the bridge, the value of the body is so diminished in your sight that you will see no need at all to magnify it. For you will realize that the only value the body has is to, establish, is to enable you to bring your brothers to the bridge with you and to be released together there. The bridge itself is nothing more than a transition in the perspective of reality. On this side, everything you see is grossly distorted and completely out of perspective. What is little and insignificant is magnified, and what is strong and powerful cut down to littleness. In the transition, there is a period of confusion in which a sense of actual disorientation may occur. But fear it not, for it means only that you have been willing to let go your hold on the distorted frame of reference that seemed to hold together your world. This frame of reference is built around the special relationship. Without this illusion, there could be no meaning you would still seek here. Fear not that you would be abruptly lifted and hurtled into reality. Time is kind, and if you use it on behalf of reality, it will keep gentle pace with you in your transition. The urgency is only in dislodging your mind from its fixed position here. This will not leave you homeless and without a frame of reference. The period of disorientation which precedes the actual transition is far shorter than the time it took to fix your mind so firmly on illusions. Delay will hurt you now, more than before, only because you realize it is delay and that escape from pain is really possible. Find hope and comfort rather than despair in this. 
you could not long find even the illusion of love in any special relationship here. For you are no longer wholly insane, and you would soon recognize the guilt of self-betrayal for what it is. Nothing you seek to strengthen in the special relationship is really part of you, and you cannot keep part of the thought system that taught you it was real and understand the thought that knows what you are. You have allowed the thought of your reality to enter your mind, and because you invited it, it will abide with you. Your love for it will not allow you to betray yourself, and you would not enter into a relationship where it could not go with you, for you would not want it, want to be apart from it. Be glad you have escaped the mockery of salvation the ego offered you, and look not back with longing on the travesty it made of your relationships. Now no one needs suffer, for you have come too far to yield to the illusion of beauty and holiness of guilt. Only the holy insane could look on death and suffering and sickness and despair and see it thus. What guilt has wrought is ugly, fearful, and very dangerous. See no illusion of truth and beauty there, and be thankful that there is a place where truth and beauty wait for you. Go on to meet them gladly, and learn how much awaits for you the simple willingness to give up nothing because it is nothing. The new perspective you will gain from crossing over will be the understanding of where heaven is. From this side, it seems to be outside and across the bridge. Yet as you cross it, it will join with you and become one with you. And you will think in glad astonishment that for all this you gave up nothing. The joy of heaven, which has no limit, is increased with each light that returns to take its rightful place within it. Wait no longer for the love of God and you. And may the holy instant speed you on the way, as it will surely do, Yet, but let it come to you. Let me read that again. And may the holy instant speed you on the way, as it surely will do, if you but let it come to you. The Holy Spirit asks only little help of you. Whenever your thoughts wander to a special relationship which still attracts you, enter with him into a holy instant, and there let him release you. He needs only your willingness to share his perspective, to give it to you completely. And your willingness need not be complete, because he is perfect. It is his task to atone for your willingness by his perfect faith, and it is his faith you share with him there out of your recognition of your unwillingness for your release. His perfect willingness is given you. Call upon him, for heaven is at his call, and let him call on heaven for you. Chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions, Section 7, The End of Illusions. It is impossible to get, let go of the past without relinquishing the special relationship. For the special relationship is an attempt to reenact the past and change it. Imagined slights, remembered pain, past disappointments, perceived injustices and deprivations will all enter into the special relationship, which becomes a way in which you seek to restore your wounded self-esteem. What basis would you have for choosing a special partner without the past? Every such choice is made because of something evil in the past to which you cling and for which must someone else atone. The special relationship takes vengeance on the past. By seeking to remove suffering in the past, it overlooks the present in its preoccupation with the past and its total commitment to it. No special relationship is experienced in the present. 
shades of the past envelop it and make it what it is. It has no meaning in the present, and if it means nothing now, it cannot have any real meaning at all. How can you change the past except in fantasy? And who can give you what you think the past deprived you of? The past is nothing. Do not seek to lay blame for deprivation on it, for the past is gone. You cannot really let, wait, you cannot really not let go what has already gone. It must be, therefore, that you are maintaining the illusion that it has not gone because you think it serves some purpose that you want fulfilled. And it must also be that this purpose could not be fulfilled in the present, but only in the past. Do not try to underestimate the intensity of the ego's drive for vengeance on the past. It is completely savage and completely insane. For the ego remembers everything you have done that has offended it and seeks retribution of you. The fantasies it brings to its chosen relationships in which to act out its hate are fantasies of your destruction. For the ego holds the past against you, and in your escape from the past, it sees itself deprived of the vengeance it believes you so justly merit. Yet without your allegiance in your own destruction, the ego could not hold you to the past in the special relationship you are allowing your destruction to be. That, that this is insane is obvious, but what is less obvious is that the present is useless to you while you pursue the ego's goal as its ally. The past is gone. Seek not to preserve it in the special relationship that binds you to it and would teach you salvation is past, and so you must return to the past to find salvation. There is no fantasy that does not contain the dream of retribution for the past. Would you act out the dream or let it go? In the special relationship, it does not seem to be an acting out of vengeance that you seek. And even when the hatred and the savagery break briefly through, the illusion of love is not profoundly shaken. Yet the one thing the ego never allows to reach awareness is that the special relationship is the acting out of vengeance on yourself. Yet what else could it be? In seeking the special relationship, you look not for glory in yourself. You have denied that it is there and the relationship becomes your substitute for it. And vengeance becomes your substitute for atonement, and the escape from vengeance becomes your loss. Against the ego's insane notion of salvation, the Holy Spirit gently lays the holy instant. We said before that the Holy Spirit must teach through comparisons and uses opposites to point to truth. The holy instant is the opposite of the ego's fixed belief in salvation through vengeance for the past. In the holy instant, it is understood that the past is gone, and with its passing, the drive for vengeance has been uprooted and has disappeared. The stillness and the peace of now unfold you, rather enfold you in perfect gentleness. Everything is gone except the truth. For a time, you may attempt to bring illusions into the holy instant to hinder your full awareness of the complete difference in all respects between your experience of truth and illusion. Yet you will not attempt this long. In the holy instant, the power of the Holy Spirit will prevail because you joined him. The illusions you bring with you will weaken the experience of him for a while and will prevent you from keeping the experience in your mind. Yet the holy instant is eternal 
and your illusions of time will not prevent the timelessness from being what it is, nor you from experiencing it as it is. What God has given you is truly given and will be truly received. For God's gift have no reality apart from your receiving them. Your receiving completes his giving. You will receive because it is his will to give. He gave the holy instant to you, and it is impossible that you receive it, not because he gave it. When he willed his son be free, his son was free. In the holy instant is his reminder that his son will always be exactly as he was created. And everything the Holy Spirit teaches you is to remind you that you have received what God has given you. There is nothing you can hold against reality. For all that must be forgiven are the illusions that you have held against your brothers. Their reality has no past and only illusions can be forgiven. God holds nothing against anyone for he is incapable of illusions of any kind. Release your brothers from the savagery, rather the slavery of their illusions, by forgiving them for the illusions you perceive in them. Thus you will learn that you have been forgiven, for it is you who offered them illusions. In the holy instant this is done for you in time, to bring you the true condition of heaven. Remember that you always choose between illusion and truth, between the real atonement that would heal and the ego's atonement that would destroy. The power of God and all his love without limit will support you as you seek only your place in the plan of atonement arising from his love. Be an ally of God and not the ego in seeking how atonement can come to you. His help suffices, for his messenger understands how to restore the kingdom to you and to place all of your investment in salvation in your relationship with him. Seek and find his message in the holy instant, where all illusions are forgiven. From there, the miracle extends to bless everyone and to resolve all problems, be they perceived as great or small, possible or impossible. There is nothing that will play, give place to him and to his majesty. To join in close relationship with him is to accept relationships as real, and through their reality to give over all illusions for the reality of your relationships with God. Praise be to your relationship with him and to no other. The trust lies there and nowhere else. You choose this or nothing. Forgive our illusions, Father, and help us accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgiveness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you would have given, and accept but this into the minds which you created and and which you love. Amen. So that is the end of chapter 16. So thank you for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed this reading. If you need support, you can reach out to me at 907-351-3003. You can message me on Facebook or YouTube or on SoundCloud. And I will hope to see you here next Sunday for the next reading, Chapter 17 of The Course in Miracles. Namaste and much love.